Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 756. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is August 23rd, 2022. All right, thank you for joining us for another program of Anglican Unscripted. This is going to be a special program because I'm outside. Jill kicked me out of the RV. She has an important meeting that I can't interrupt with my silly show. So here I am on the picnic table uh, on the eastern shores of Lake Michigan in a town called Holland, Michigan. George, how are you doing today? I'm fantastic. Life is wonderful. I missed my calling as a peasant because I've been doing uh, labor in the afternoons, early evenings around the house. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I just feel great with all this heavy physical labor. You're a first time homeowner. And so this is all new to you and stuff like that. I, I, I owned a home since I was 25 and I'm tired of that stuff. You know, give me an RV, give me the road, give me some dotted lines going down the road. That's all I need to keep me happy. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you're into this new homeowner st stuff. Uh, stuff, but the biggest problem is uh, Jill would have trouble choosing colors for the walls or the carpeting and all that. And I'd, I'd keep having to change all that type of stuff, George. Well, Susan, my wife, is heading up to uh, Ocean City, New Jersey. Her brother owns a house there, a summer home, mm -hmm. and my daughters and my wife are meeting my mother-in-law and her, my brother-in-law and all sure, that. Yeah. And they're going to be there for two weeks, uh, Labor Day weekend. And while they're away, I'm going to paint the trim on the inside of the house because we have the wooden uh, trim. And then I'm going to choose three colors and make little things because my wife has a hard enough time choosing nail color polish. And so basically I'm going to say, here are the three shades of off-white, very light yellow, very slate blue that you sure. can will do the interior walls and you pick which ones you want. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, yeah, I would always um, have to say Home Depot was out of all the other colors, Jill. So this is this is what we got to go with, you know. And it, it worked for us. I'm hope I hope it works for you as well. Uh, let's get on to some news. There's a lot going on out there. Uh, there is a new diocese called the Southern Cross. Uh, now, if you're a big Crosby, Stills, and Nash fan, they have a very famous song called uh, Southern Cross. And uh, I thought maybe somebody had heard that right before they made the name change, George. What's going on in Australia? Well, I thought it was the Diocese of uh, Neil Young Diocese. Yeah, that's right. Never mind. <laughs> uh, Southern Man Diocese. Uh -huh. well, Something's happening Gafcon here. Australia. Gafcon Australia has taken a major step, and it has created a non-geographic diocese for uh, Anglican parishes that cannot live with the uh, innovations of uh, doctrine and discipline that some Australians have adopted, Australian dioceses have adopted. Uh, some Australian dioceses are pushing forward not done it yet, but they're just about to go with gay marriage. Uh, basically going down the Episcopal uh, road, the Canadian road of total uh, wacko liberationist stuff. Well, uh, at the uh, Gafgan Australia meeting in Canberra uh, last week, uh, the Diocese of the Southern Cross was formed and it has its first parish. A congregation in the Diocese of Brisbane essentially mailed the keys to the building to uh, Archbishop Philip Aspinall and are now meeting in a uh, rented facility. And they're the new diocese, first congregation, and the retired Archbishop of Sydney, Glenn Davies, is their bishop. And we, I expect the this new diocese to grow quickly from two sources. Sydney has been planting non-denominational churches in other dioceses uh, around Australia over the past uh, 25 odd years, where the ministers come out of the Sydney uh, seminary uh, but are moving to places like Newcastle or Perth or things like that. I expect some of them to come on board, as well as congregations and clergy who cannot, who are minorities in their diocese on uh, and follow a traditional understanding of uh, Christian ethics. Uh, the Bishop of Tasmania is the president of Gafcon uh, Australia, Richard Condy, and he is quite straightforward. Uh, as straightforward as the Global South primates were at Lambeth, that these innovations are contrary to God's word, they are a, a repugnant to any Christian believer, and we must have a lifeboat, a safe harbor, for those Anglicans unable to, in good conscience, remain part of an institution. 
that has gone down this road. Yeah, I find it interesting because uh, this is a brand new diocese and already it's probably larger than the diocese of the upper Michigan, northern Michigan. <laughs> yes, I, I, I wouldn't doubt that. Oh, actually, no, now, Kevin, it's the summertime, so people like you may be up in, uh, up in the North Peninsula and going uh, to <laughs> fill in the churches for the six weeks of sunshine they have up there. Yeah. Yes, there's a Go ahead. pushback, a lot, lot of pushback. Mm -hmm. uh, the primate, Jeffrey Smith of Australia, he's the Archbishop of Adelaide, he gave sort of a milk toast company man statement, essentially saying that um, these people may worship in an Anglican way, but unless they're members of the Anglican Church of Australia, they're not real Anglicans. And the only way to be a member of the Anglican Church of Australia is to be a member of one of its existing dioceses. So they're a new denomination. Uh, the Mark Calder, the Bishop of Bathurst, which is also in New South Wales, had a very supportive stance saying, understand why this is happening. I see the issues that are involved. And I just pray that we find a way to resolve all this. On the opposite spectrum was the Bishop of Newcastle, uh, Peter Stewart, who's a piece of work. Uh, Newcastle has been the epicenter of the uh, abuse scandal in Australia. And in fact, uh, there's a new story that a new story breaking that a another Aust another Newcastle priest has been laicized uh, for his uh, cover up of the sexual molestations of the former dean of Newcastle, Graham Lawrence, so on and so forth. But uh, Peter Stewart said, if any of my if any of you to his clergy he wrote a letter saying, if any of you went to this meeting, if any of you support this meeting, if any of you are thinking about any of this stuff, declare your interests. I want to know who you are so I can kill you, essentially. <laughs> Henry Parsley. Yes, before all the, you know, at the very beginning when people were, AAC was a support group. Uh, when we had the Anglican Communion Network, Bishop Parsley put out a letter to his clergy saying, if you've been to any of these meetings, if you support the AAC, I consider you a traitor and uh, uh, hit the road, Jack. Uh, so he, pre, yeah, pre, preemptive strike against uh, those conservatives. So you've got these th three uh, things, uh, sort of the mumbo jumbo from the archbishop, the uh, death threats from the Bishop of Newcastle, ecclesiastical death threats, and the concern from the Bishop of Bathurst. Yes, and there's also a major difference in the structure of the Australian National Church compared to the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church, we've had these lawsuits of whether a diocese can leave, and in Illinois they can, in Texas they can, in South Carolina they can, but they can, they can, and they can't, you know, back and forth. And in other states, Pennsylvania, uh, California, they can't leave. Uh, Australia, there's no question that the diocese uh, is the decision maker. The buck stops with them, not the national church. So in the past, for instance, the Diocese of Sydney has been sending ministers supporting the uh, Church of England in South Africa, uh, which is now called the Reformed Episcopal Anglican Church uh, Reach. Uh, yeah. Uh, whereas the National Australian Church didn't recognize this as an Anglican church, Sydney did for like 75 years now, uh, helping consecrate its bishops. So just because the primate of Australia says, I don't consider them Anglicans, Sydney can say, well, boo to you. We in Tasmania and Northwest Australia can say, well, we do consider themselves, consider them Anglicans and we're in a relationship with them. And it helps that their new bishop doesn't need to be consecrated because he's the former Archbishop of Sydney. Uh, so that, that makes it all work so more cheesily. But what's so exciting to me about this is, yes, of course, there's the political uh, machinations and everything. Kanish Garofal, the current Archbishop of Sydney, says, we're not going anywhere. Sydney's not leaving. We have a firm place, and you, know, you, can't, uh, you can't kick us out, and uh, we're not walking out. But what is so refreshing is to hear the speeches uh, and hear the words being offered by Richard Condy, by Kanishka Raffle, by the leaders of GAFCON Australia, by Peter Jensen. Um, there's been great videos uh, on uh, the internet uh, that we've, uh, oh, what's his name, passed, uh, 
Oh, who's who's the fellow? Steel, that, Daniel the Steel. Austra- Steel. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. I hate to embarrass people like that by no, my, we're my, embarrassing my, ourselves by not remembering. Hell, <laughs> remember, folks, it's unscripted. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and we're old, and Kevin has had his coffee, and uh, George uh, yeah, has been yeah, out of this I'm time. only halfway through. The, it's like Daniel Steele or something. Hold yeah. on a second. Um, but, uh, you know, it's it's great that he had got a chance to sit down. I know we have a link to it on Anglican Inc. Um, uh, but uh, that's a, a different news organization in a different country. And uh, early in the morning, George and I are not going to remember stuff like that. If you, do, if you do remember, put it in the short comments. So, But there's a clarity. And there's a... Um, it's like... Go, I remember going to... Kevin, you and I would go to the early GAF, uh, ACN conferences. And there would be... Hem and Haw. Mixed messages. Yes. Hem and Haw. Hem and Haw. You know... Uh, here, maybe a different structures allow the more freedom to the Australian bishops, but there's real leadership, there's real truth telling, there's real uh, fervor, and vigor, and excitement. So, Dominic Steele. Dominic Steele. Dominic Steele. No, we're right. apologize for our, right. my uh, yeah. our age. My uh, he's a young guy down oh in Australia. My. Yeah, he doesn't forget our name. I hope. <laughs> Oh my, but it it's this is a friends, this is a good development. Mm-hmm. This is a good thing. Because I expect it to grow and prosper as new congregations are planted and people are one for Jesus Christ. Well and I mean that's it, it, I just I can, want Yeah, go ahead. Finish up. No, I was just gonna go down a rabbit hole. You can go down a different rabbit hole. Well I was gonna say this is interesting because uh there has been such a good setup for this. The ACNA for all intents and purposes was a great success. We know that we can do it differently and we can do it separately. And we we took on that bold step to uh be outside of the realm of Canterbury and the outside of the realm of the instruments of unity and it worked. And I, I think dioceses and non-geographic dioceses like are being formed in Australia know that the precedent was set by the ACNA. We're going to do this too, and we're going to have great success. And, I mean, that's the big difference here. Is, I, you know. And people say, well, Australia is a secularized country. It's tough. It's a tough soil. Yeah. Well, I read an article about uh, Stockholm, Sweden. There's a uh, church that has a thousand people worshiping every Sunday. And they worship in English in Stockholm, and it's made up of Swedes plus Nigerians, Ghanaians, immigrants, um, who are, you know, responding to the call of the Spirit. Yes, they do have some Swedish services, but it's an independent church, evangelical church, and and di- and the dying church of Sweden, um, it doesn't have anything to touch this uh, because it has because the spirit is withdrawn from much of the Church of Sweden as it has from much of the Anglican Church of Australia and the Church. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, just because the world says this is a tough, uh, tough, tough place to work doesn't mean the spirit cannot revive and reform and fill the hearts of believers. Yeah, I don't think the Holy Spirit cares about what type of ground you're on. I don't think God gives any care about you complaining, well, it's really hard here in New Jersey because people are, 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 are backsliders and they don't care. <laughs> Keep working. You know, plant those seeds. Till that soil. Bring people to the uh, knowledge of a living Christ. So, uh, let's move on to our next story. That was a long story. Uh, congratulations to the Southern Cross. But now we, we, we're talking about the Diocese of South Carolina, which has had the most interesting legal saga uh, that I, we've been watching now for almost 10 years uh, in, in different forms. And the Supreme Court has once again swayed and walked away from their previous opinion. And a press release was put out, an interesting press release was put out by the Diocese of South Carolina. And, and it didn't say we won. <laughs> it said, hey... <laughs> <laughs> it said, South Carolina Supreme Court approves petition for rehearing sought by six parishes of the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina. <laughs> I reprinted their press release. Essentially says that six of the seven parishes have got their property back now. 
they the South Carolina the Supreme Court flipped yet again. Yeah. After the final final, remember Kevin, six months ago we were saying this is final final. final. Well, yeah. no, it isn't because six of the seven who appealed this as parishes now have their property. So I hope this is final final, but we'll see. But in fact. The prize for the worst headline of a press release goes to this because Kevin wrote me the next day saying, "Are we covering this story?" Yeah, <laughs> That's a very underwhelming headline. <laughs> well, Chip Edgar has written to the diocese uh, about this on the 18th of August. He's still in England at the time, mm -hmm. and he's saying that you know the diocese wasn't involved in this latest uh, round of litigation. The parishes were, and six or seven parishes, I believe, had filed a, a petition for rehearing of their individual circumstances, uh, saying that they had never acceded to the Episcopal Church and giving them their property. And after review of the documents and a review of the pleadings, the Supreme Court found that six of the seven were right. So churches like Old St. Andrew in Charleston, which is like 400 years old and is a big social church, went from being under the threat of losing everything to the Episcopal Diocese in South Carolina, are now safe and secure in their property in the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina. So, but Chip Edgar has taken the high road because he wants to forge, you know, amicable relations with the Episcopal Church. And he and the new Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese basically want to get on with their lives and ministries because this thing's been hanging over there must be some very wealthy lawyers in South Carolina after all these years. And I, if they blow something simple like property rights, what other decisions are they blowing completely out of the water at the uh, the Supreme Court level in in South Carolina? I mean, this is simple law. You know, I just like I can't imagine. It doesn't, it doesn't say much for the uh, the erudition of the South Carolina justices. Uh, well, I, I, I went nothing to put is a, the same every time. If you're a lawyer from the Diocese of South Carolina or a lawyer in South Carolina, I'm going to put a little buzz in your ear because they said in the press release that, uh, if I can find up here, four of the parishes in today's ruling were judged to have never created a trust based on that earlier standard, the standard uh, put by uh, the Supreme Court in their last decision. Two more were judged to have created a revocable trust, which was subsequently and properly revoked. Well, if you can revoke it in the past, you're allowed to revoke it in the future. And you can certainly uh, go down that challenging uh, uh, legal precedent and get all your churches back if, if you so desire. Uh, that's a big hole they left open if if they did so in, in certain legalese. Oh, George. Uh, oh, guess, guess, Kevin, I guess it's not over. <laughs> no, it's not over. <laughs> It's not over at all. We will be reporting in three months about how some other churches had, had their uh, requests taken up by the Supreme Court. Um, let's move on here to our next story. Um, uh, this is a hard one. Uh, Charlie Holt has uh, decided, with the help of the Episcopal Churches 815, to step back and not uh, continue the process uh, to become the Bishop of the Diocese of Florida. This is a saga. Uh, uh, you know, this is um, something that happened earlier this spring. He was elected uh, to be the ne next bishop, but there were irregularities because of COVID times. May, may or may not have been a, 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 a quorum of clergy. And um, the biggest problem Charlie Holt has is he holds Orthodox Christian views and values, and that won't fly in today's Episcopal Church, George. The uh, at the election of the Bishop of uh, Florida, mm -hmm. there wasn't a quorum of uh, clergy present because of COVID and whatnot. And so the bishop and, and got together with the chancellor, Sam Howard, got together with the chancellor and the secretary of convention and said, we're going to allow, you know, they knew they weren't going to have a quorum because of the registration numbers. And a few days before the convention, they said, we're going to allow Zoom uh, attendance for clergy. Uh, we're not going to allow it for lay people because lay people have alternates. And so it's so long as the deputation is represented properly, there's no problem. Nobody objected at the time. Charlie Holt won on the third one election on the third ballot. 
after the election, the liberals went ballistic because Charlie holds to traditional views on human sexuality. And some, and some of the opponents include people who ran against him. I know one curate who was fired because he said something uh, positive about Charlie Holt, who was fired. I mean, it's that level of anger from about 10% of the diocese. And there has been a contingency plan uh, long before Holt's election. And part of it was that they were going to, the candidates were going to drop out if it looked like Holt was going to win to make sure the liberal got the nod, but they had sequestered the candidates uh, uh, so that they couldn't basically communicate between rounds, if you will, and Charlie's won on the third vote. Well, two, an objection was filed, and it was called the Dunkel Objection by the Standing Committee, because one of the people filing it is the retired dean of General Theological Seminary, Kurt Dunkel. Kurt had been the candidate of the ordinary for Sam Howard earlier in his ecclesial life. And this objection alleged that uh, it required 30 days notice for a change of rules, and this was uh, not done. And it was taken up by the Episcopal Church's uh, courts, and the court said, yes, the letter of the law says this was not run properly. No matter the spirit of the law, which was nobody objected at the time, and it was only an objection based on the outcome, not on the process. Well, it, that and most dioceses and the leadership of 815 have operated with COVID rules for meetings now for two and a half years. It's not like, you know, this is yeah, the first but, diocese. Yeah, but they imagine. didn't give 30 days notice and all this. And that. Uh, so, okay. So where do we stand now? At, at, me, at the same time as there was the technical objection, uh, activists across the United States have been lobbying standing committees to withhold consent of Charlie Holt because he doesn't have sound views on human sexuality. Okay. So last week, Charlie Holt withdrew his acceptance of the election of the invitation to be bishop based upon the, uh, the ruling. And the standing committee put out a letter saying, now what? Um, now, there's several ways forward. And now here's where we speculate. They could do what South Carolina did when Mark Lawrence's first election was not ratified, which is run again and just have Charlie Holt as a single candidate. Problem with that is that with the Mark Lawrence case, Mark Lawrence had un unanimous support from within the diocese, and it was just external forces that were against him. Here, you've got a tiny minority, 10%, but a very vocal minority saying death before Charlie Holt. Well, and that's that's the important point here. As well as external opponents. The, the Episcopal Church has had made Mark Lawrence a living martyr. Okay, mm -hmm. here with uh, Charlie Holt, I think the internal uh, opposition within the diocese isn't going to allow for a Mark Lawrence type situation. Yeah, and it's actually made a martyr, if you will, of Sam Howard, the bishop, because he's the one. It's not Charlie Holt's fault this was done. It's Sam Howard's fault. And Sam Howard is not a particularly popular bishop. He's not somebody who could rally everybody to his cause. Um, he's had a rocky time as Bishop of Florida. And Charlie Holt's difficult position is, unlike Mark Lawrence, where the diocese is solidly behind you and you just have to get the rest of the church to go along, you've got a bishop who is unlikely. But he can be, he, I'm told he can be vindictive and a little petty. So you've got an unpopular bishop back as your main backer within the diocese. You have a group that includes the cathedral dean, the former canon of the ordinary, uh, some leaders of one or two large parishes saying anybody but you. And then you have the activists trying to convince the liberal diocese not to back him. It's going to be a tough road, whether they rerun a regular election, whether they run a uh, special election with only Charlie. They may say, oh, well, we need Pete. We ne they may need to do a Justin Welby and say, oh, we need unity. And so we need to run a vanilla candidate that nobody will get upset about. We need to run another bland bureaucrat, which is 90% of the bishops of the Episcopal Church right now, colorless, you know, as C.S. Lewis would say, men without check, uh, T.S. Eliot would say, 
men without chests. Um, so it's a bad situation for Charlie Holt and f for the Episcopal Diocese of Florida, because I'm asking myself in my prayer life, you know, I've been praying for Charlie and I pray for the diocese, and is the Holy Spirit being withdrawn? In other words, here you have a spirit-filled uh, Orthodox bishop being torpedoed on technical grounds. Is the spirit, is this just a victory of Satan that will be overcome? Or is the spirit telling us that the diocese of Florida is not redeemable at this time? I don't know. Um, I, I don't maybe know if Charlie should run in Florida. <laughs> where... <laughs> well, I don't know if we want to limit it to just the diocese either. You know, is this a, a Episcopal church uh, that can't function? Uh, you know, there's always been, well, we're going to have mutual flourishing. We're going to have uh, an ability for both sides to exist within uh, the Episcopal Church. And we will, you know, there'll never be a, a time when we're kicking out the conservatives, God forbid. Come on, we're not, we're not that mean. Well, 770 <laughs> depositions later, you might be a little mean. You know, and I think it, it, it may be broader than just thinking of um, the diocese. Because I think if 815 had a candidate that they wanted, they would have fought for them. And mm -hmm. Charlie Holt was not the candidate they wanted. And they were not going to fight for them. Um, and we've seen this before uh, with other Orthodox and conservative bishops. So, And it also speaks to the relative, you know, when you've got a 10% minority that is vocal, wealthy, and organized, they can dominate institutions and churches. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not just the Episcopal Church that has collapsed. It's the inst the FBI, uh, the universities, the media. Uh, not every FBI agent is a crook. In fact, hardly any are. But if you look at the guys at the top, they all are. The, the, at the you very look at top. Yeah. In, in my alumni lose letter, uh, it was said that Yale University now has more administrators than faculty. What's that about? I mean, and it's the administrators. Uh, well, I won't start down that road. Well, no, it, it's, a, it's a great rabbit trail to understand that corruption exists in all our muses. Okay? And it's just, it's sad. It's getting worse. Um, woke has made it ten times, a hundred times worse. Uh, and so, you, the desire to kick out the Orthodox and the Conservatives from all platforms is being fulfilled. You know, mm. and it, it's hard to watch as a conservative it, so you know you're, you're seeing conservatives fleeing the universities you've seen conservatives purged from the media you see them uh uh in industry big business uh big business uh, your daughter used to work for general electric mm -hmm. and my goodness that could be just as woke as yale university in their uh, human resources department it was i, I don't know if I, I want to relate this story because um Certain people She'll get, get mad at you. Or? Yeah, no, certain people get in trouble. Um, but basically, they had a policy that if you were a certain color skin, you were promoted up a chain um, for visible virtual signaling, so to speak. So our board of directors for this is compiled of so many people of this skin color. Look how good we are. Those people of that certain skin color were complaining they, they were given empty jobs with nothing to do. They were just there to come in, wear the nice suit or nice dress suit, um, pantsuit, so that uh, um, the outside world would see how good GE was, but their opinions were never allowed into the corporate boardrooms. It was just empty virtue signaling all the way up. They liked that they were you know making six figures, but they were they they knew they were just tokens, and uh, somebody I know had a conversation with several of these people who were like, "This is ridiculous. They don't care what we say. They don't care what we think. We're just here to be poster childs for the virtual um, signaled woke General Electric." And it's like, That's yeah. how the Anglican Communion works. That's, That's right. how the Lambeth Palace works. Mm -hmm. Uh, we hire people to give uh, a variety of colors for the group photo. We don't hire them for merit. Absolutely. So, 
<sighs> so it's it's all industries are corrupt and sadly so is the church hey we got a cool story George out of Chicago uh, apparently there's uh, reason to sell some property that belongs to the uh, uh, cathedral uh, institution down there in the Episcopal Church and it's bringing about a bit of angst now about four months ago five months ago would have been a perfect time to sell property anywhere here in America Chicago never really saw the boom of the last two years though uh, their boom was five years ago and six years ago Chicago real uh, the Diocese of Chicago is on uh, is in a small office building low-rise office building next door to the cathedral mm -hmm. in a very desirable part of the city of Chicago Cathedral is a hundred year old, you know, massive Gothic structure, all this and that. Small congregation, because it's a downtown church. And it's funded essentially by rents. It gave the land, most of the land, under which the office building where the diocese is located. Well, the diocese, every so often, the diocese floats the idea of selling the building every time the real estate market crashes. Kevin, you're right. They could have sold this five years ago for multiples higher. Uh, but now in the middle of a real estate slump, which is uh, hitting Chicago pretty hard because Chicago also has the crime problem under its current mayor, the diocese is saying, well, we need to sell because we need money to support all of our ailing parishes and we need to subsidize them. With the cathedral saying, hey, wait a minute, if you sell this, we're out of business because all the money that pays to repair our lead roof, a slate roof and you know, keep the this church operating, pay for the choir and all this and that comes from, not from congrega congregational giving, but from our investments in the land. And we gave this land to you. And, and so the diocese said, okay, we'll give you, these are, I don't remember the exact numbers. We'll give you a certain amount of, let's say $10 million over the next 10 years. And the, and the cathedral said, well, it's going to cost us $16 million. So we're going right. to be bankrupt in five years. It costs two, two to $3 million a year to properly maintain that building. And, and we're not even talking staffing. You go a little higher and you get in the staffing costs. And this is kind of your, your old town Episcopal church trying to survive. Um, we've seen this in, in less drastic forms all over the country where there's a downtown uh, church and it's dried up. The people don't go there. Um, I don't think it's quite the Trinity Wall Street. Trinity Wall Street still has a congregation. But, you know, do, do 40, 50, 60 people go here, George? That's about a Sunday. Yeah, yeah. If you don't include the choir of about 20, which is paid choir members. No, um, it's, it, the problem is the cathedral gave the land to the diocese so the diocese can do what it wants with it because it never imagined they would take this course. Now, the problem is the new Bishop of Chicago is a, is a black woman who had a stroke shortly before her consecration. And she's been under, she's been recovering. Uh, they've had a provisional Bishop. Uh, she's been consecrated. She says so she's now Bishop, but she's basically off the scene. And this is a liberal versus liberal fight um, because the, liberal parishes in the city that cannot make their own way because they've scared off all the people or the communities have moved away. They still have to pay their vicar or the rector and they see the money from the cathedral giving them a 10 year lease on life. Well, the cathedral with its nice choir and its art and its flowers and you know, the, the, the sort of things that cathedrals are known for, it says, we need that money. And they're fighting over diminishing uh, the pie is getting smaller uh, because they don't have the congregational giving. If congregational giving was strong, there wouldn't be an issue. But the Diocese of Chicago is hemorrhaging people. Um, and it doesn't help that the city of Chicago uh, is a mess the, um, with crime and, uh, well, I think and the suburbs. Uh, that is really, you know, northern Chicago right now and uh, immediate eastern Chicago is just, you know, full of violence, gun violence, uh, youth violence, uh, black on black crime uh, is just astronomical. There's not a weekend that I've been here in the Midwest where we've not read about, you know, 10 people shot, 15 people shot, 19 people shot um, in Chicago this weekend. And no response from the mayor. 
you know, she has she has no ability to respond to this in any other way than to call for, um, you know, gun control and not violence control or not uh, not reestablishing the family, which uh, would probably be the best part. To to I yeah. saw uh, saw a little uh, I think it was on Tucker Carlson or somebody like that that the death rate by violence in the city of Chicago is greater than that currently of by civilians in the Ukraine. Oh, yeah. um, statistically, you're more likely to die in Chicago than you are during in the Ukraine war. Um, I, I drove on the outskirts of Chicago last week. We went from Madison here to Michigan, and you could die by pothole coming uh, on, the, uh, on the interstate around Chicago. It's just a mess, George. Um, so th- this... I th- the Chicago Cathedral saga is a foreshadowing, I think, of what's going to be coming across the Episcopal Church, where the fight will no longer be conservatives versus liberals. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Episcopal Church in Lake Forest, Illinois, they are not involved. They're slightly liberal, or well, they're liberal, but their money is not going to, they're not given more than they need to because they're insulated. They're going to be there uh, because of their inherited wealth and their wealthy congregation. But the vast number of uh, little churches that have had vicars put on them, who have driven away the congregations over the course of time, these people want the money, and it's the liberal versus liberal fight. And so we're, this is going to happen for whole dioceses, where dioceses can't make it anymore. Um, it's, yeah, it's not just, yeah, what we're seeing actually is um, diminishing by diocese, but there's just no ability to re-engage and refill the coffers. And they, they've we, not discovered, you know, even after the decade of evangelism three decades ago, they've not discovered a way to refill the churches. Yeah, we in Central Florida complain that we have to give 11% uh, of, our, of our income to the diocese. Well, they're dioceses that, you know, are up to 20%, and it's only going to get worse. And eventually we're going to have... Uh, some parishes that have the money say no more. Uh, I'm sorry, we can't give you a quarter of our income and we get the bishop once every three years. You know, the people will not stand for it. People will vote with their feet and they don't fund stuff if they see the money is being sent away for purposes that they don't approve of. Turn my mute button off. I've had the mute button here because every once in a while a car will go by or an airplane. So I wanted to save the audience from those distractions. It's just distracting enough looking at me on the outside in the in the weather here. So I didn't want to add to that. Uh, next discussion, and it's kind of um, strange. I was talking to George before with the program that uh, Ben and Jerry's wanted to be sure that they could ban the sale of their ice cream from such terrorist organizations as Israel and yeah they have a parent company that owns them and it, it doesn't matter what Ben and Jerry think uh, it, you know money talks and so uh, they were overruled and what's the name of the company that uh, owns uh, Unilever yeah Unilever, Unilever said how we're selling in Israel what are you talking about They're, they like ice cream just as much as anybody else and you said well we have another uh, Israel story I said what's that he says it looks like uh, Humas and maybe the Diocese of Jerusalem uh, have been conducting joint operations I said, ah, we want to focus this out George what's going on well last the violence has been intensifying in the West Bank over the past few months and it started uh, with uh, basically a campaign on social media by activists of Fatah and in the PLO to sort of uh, raise the temperature between in the West Bank area and East Jerusalem. And then we had some incidents where there was where some Jew Jewish uh, settlers bought a hotel in a Christian area and the hotel, the Christians who sold it didn't have the authority didn't have the the agreement of other christians and so went to the supreme court and i'm sorry but these people were your agents therefore they could do it and that caused more grief and then we started to have stone throwings and shootings and attacks well last week uh the idf raided seven uh ngos in the west bank okay for the audience who is the idf 
Israel Defense Force. There you go. Right. Uh, they raided seven uh, non-governmental charities whom Israel has identified in the past as front organizations who are terrorist groups. One of these terrorist groups, which calls itself a humanitarian civil rights advocacy group, rents their space from an Episcopal church in the West Bank. And the Israelis raided the seven terrorist organizations, one, including the one on the Episcopal church property. And they did a no-knock uh, raid, just like at Mar-a-Lago, uh, and uh, broke some windows and broke some doors and went through the church and looked at the church and the adjacent office building that they rented to the terrorist group, so-called, by the Israelis. Well, the archbishop in Jerusalem put out a letter of protest saying, oh, the Israelis have raided an Episcopal church. Isn't this awful? Oh, yes, it's awful, but it was collateral damage in a war that uh, has been going on for, what, since 1948? And uh, I hate to say, but if you're going to rent property to terrorist groups, uh, you're going to get dirt on your shoes. Um, but that's the point here. They're not raiding other churches. There, in fact, there's plenty of Anglican churches, you know, well, not plenty, there's two or three uh, in the area. There's only one church that got raided here. And that should tell you something. Yeah. And it got raided because of its relationship to its tenant. Uh, maybe they should maybe they should do a background search well the prop one of the problems is that if if the archbishop in jerusalem didn't make a stink then he'd be in big trouble from the islamists the prob problems that christian groups have in the middle east is that unless they mouth the official line of their governments they will be persecuted and even though so in private they may say one thing and in private uh but in public, they'll say the other because of the real threat of danger. Um, Israeli Arabs, um, they've had several polls and several uh, constant polling and this and that. But there was at one point there was uh, an Israeli village was uh, about to be given over to the uh, an Arab village in northern Israel. Galilee was to be put into the West Bank and all of its residents protested because God, we don't want to be under the PLO. We'd rather be in Israel, where the electricity works and the trains works and the school works, and we have you our know, jobs. Our jobs. Yeah. yeah. So. so it's it's one of these things that you know the, the the diocese has to put out a press release, and then the professional Jew haters in the West pick it up and show this is another example of how evil Israel is. It's an apartheid state. Yak yak yak. And when the reality is, you, there's a degree of uh, of nuance that you have to look for when you're looking at these things. Um, the Israelis uh, can be a little brusque and a little unpleasant. Uh, yeah, they're I mean, not like us in the way they interact with people. No, they're not. And, uh, you know, that's one of those realities. They're not good Midwesterners, Kevin, <laughs> no. I have to tell you. <laughs> well, that's one of those realities is... Um, is there racism and bias and uh, cultural differences and, and struggles in the Middle East? Yes. Uh, is Israel responsible for some of those? Yes, of course. Um, is Hamas and uh, uh, the Palestinians and uh, uh, other uh, ill regards responsible? Yes, it's a mess. Nobody here is innocent. Um, but Israel is not constantly trying to go into... Uh, uh, the West Bank and um, destroy it. It's been destroyed by Hamas. You know, they don't have to go in there and uh, uh, do any damage because all the damage done there is eternal. It, in, it, yeah, internal. And yeah. In Gaza, on the other side, yeah. uh, where Hamas, uh, the West Bank is controlled by the PLO, uh, Hamas controls Gaza. Mm -hmm. Gaza, Hamas is famous for putting missile batteries and strategic assets in civilian populations, in the basements of hospitals, with knowing full well that the Israelis will not target their command and control structures uh, for fear of collateral damage. Uh, they don't want to kill civilians. So this is just the way things are in that part of the world. Um, people, you know, hum, 
the Palestinians are used as human shields by their overlords against the Israelis. And though this is a, it's terrible that this had to happen. It's terrible that you can't, you know, rent your property to whoever you want. Um, the reality in that part of the world is, you know, this is going to happen. If the, if the Episcopal Church said, no, we're not going to rent to you because you're a terrorist organization, <laughs> they get the throat slit. <laughs> no, so it's, you know, it, it's a no-win situation. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it, it is no-win. All right, let's do our last story here. The last story, now that the Ram truck has started and the other uh, trucks are moving their campers out of here. Last story is going to be about the merging of seminaries. And this is kind of the overall arching discussion we're having here. Uh, the trouble within the Episcopal Church at the diocesan level. I always think that trouble within the church starts at the seminarian level. And I know Marx and uh, Stalin and uh, Hitler knew that if you wanted to affect the culture long term, you go for the schools. And if you want to affect what the church is teaching in the next generation, you go for the seminaries. And we're finding out that General Seminary and Virginia Theological are merging, George. And I'm like, well, that's the sign of the times, isn't it? When I was young, Virginia Theological Seminary had a reputation as being an evangelical low church seminary. That's not true anymore. Far from it. It's part of the liberal establishment. It calls itself broad church, meaning it's liberal. And the decline of Virginia Theological Seminary from its historic place is a whole nother topic. But General Seminary in New York City had always been the broad church corporatist seminary. A lot of people, uh, Bob Duncan went there and whatnot. And you could, and Bob Duncan and Gene Robinson, I think were classmates, were there at the same time. So you had people from both, both sides. Well, General, under its last dean, Kurt Dunkel, just went down the tubes financially. And in, uh, like all the other universities, uh, the conservatives were driven out. So the general, the general is basically is facing financial disaster, wipeout. Um, tried developing its property, it's tried to do all this stuff, but it just can't attract students. And it's very expensive uh, running an institution in New York City. And so there's now a merger agreement of sorts where the Dean of Virginia will be the Dean of General. And General's basically over. Uh, give it time, the property will be sold off, and maybe it'll be bought by Donald Trump. It'll be the Trump Theological Seminary in well, Chelsea. I thought they already sold this, did the general this already sell off. It's a real estate in New York. I mean, yeah. Didn't uh, General already sell off some of its uh, real estate? Well it's, been, yeah. it's, it, well, it's developed uh, into a conference center and things mm -hmm. like that, trying to find ways to, you know, Je Chelsea section which is on the sort of southwestern tip part of uh, Manhattan, up from lower Manhattan, used to be a very, uh, very desirable place, uh, gentrification and whatnot. And, but under, under the last mayor and then the current mayor, it's really gone downhill faster than some other parts of town where, you know, open drug dealing and, uh, homeless on the streets and you have to keep getting the bums out of the courtyard at general seminary it's you know they got to re-elect a rudy giuliani to clean up the town again and then the property be worth a fortune but right now you know it's hard to put in a hundred million dollar development of condos when you've got people shooting up heroin in your front lawn um no i think the, the, the last uh, quarter of new york city has been worse than chicago uh, when mm -hmm. you see the, the open crime that's happening, the people that are being mugged and beaten up on the streets, the subways uh, are a mess in, uh, in New York City right now. Um, New York has taken a really bad post-COVID hit. And um, it's... Well, it's bad to start with because of the policies of the last, the last mayor and now the current mayor, uh, Eric Adams, is following those policies. Yeah. And the, the district the, attorney the no is bail. one of these Soros... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the district attorney is one of these Soros-funded guys who basically uh, dismisses uh, most non most violent crime as, you know, just youthful indiscretions and things. It's, it's a mess. But New York will always be New York. It'll always be the Big Apple. And it goes through these periods. In the 70s, uh, the bad old days when Central, when uh, brought, when uh, 
oh, I'm just, my brain's not working oh, today, Kevin. In the 70s, so the Broadway, Broadway was, Times Square, yeah. you know, was a dren of, uh, den of uh, sex shops and peep shows. And then it mm -hmm. was revitalized. Disney, Disney opened with Fader, became a beautiful tourist area. Mm -hmm. Now it's going downhill again. Uh, we go through these things. Yeah. It, it, it's the way New York is. Um, but I think it's going to be more difficult to come back from, you know, in post-COVID times because the demographics are different with people who can work from home. Um, oh, you're absolutely right. The, the office tower, and it, it, it'll hurt Trinity Wall Street because they make their money with rentals of properties and things and ground rents. And you don't need 40 to story office blocks for financial industry when people, when they, with the, the companies have found it so much cheaper to have people work from their living room or on the kitchen table. You don't have these massive overhead costs. Um, or they so can work a, from a picnic table but, at a park on the side of uh, Lake Michigan. But at the same time, like my daughter and my two daughters live in urban areas in Seattle and San Francisco. Both of cities have terrible reputations, but the areas in which they live are absolutely beautiful. Uh, they're going through and don't have the problems that you see on TV. And it's because those neighborhoods are filled with people of their age. Uh, we used to call them yuppies in our generation. I don't know what they call them today. We but young, uh, we, we were unmarried in our generation. <laughs> I think they call young them unmarried yeah. people with disposable income. Yeah, so. that's cool. All right, well, but, that's but, but it's it, you know General Seminary and the Cathedral in Chicago. It's the same story. Mm -hmm. uh, smaller pie. Well, how many um, seminaries are left? We we basically uh, lost one, eight. right? This is left in what sense? physically go still exists or still what? exists oh swanee's still there yeah uh church divinity school of the pacific this mm -hmm. seminary of the southwest yale yale is special because yale's got more money than it knows what to do with and it'll always be there more administration um, but the cambridge theological seminary merged mm -hmm. with union theological that's right theological sem mm -hmm. oh, you're broken. we have trinity seminary but i don't yeah. know um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. That's all uh, right. But, uh, in Swanee. Sure. Uh, there was the uh, uh, one in uh, North in Evanston, Illinois, which is now, I think, non-residential, and uh, Seabury Western. Mm -hmm. And then there was Bexley Hall in Ohio, which is essentially non-residential. And then there was the one up in Rochester, New York, which has been merged out of existence. So there's no market for liberal seminaries anymore. Uh, Trinity's doing just fine, I understand. Yeah. Neshota House, of course, is Neshota's doing fine, doing but that's great. again a niche seminar. Yes. Yeah. Diocese of Central Florida will essentially send people to Neshota House because it's the one, last one that is viewed, if you will, as being purely Episcopal, purely sound. All right, I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 756 of Anglican Unscripted.